امروز برنامه امروز ما به این صورت خواهد بود که حدود یه ساعتی پریزنتیشن هست در فاصله یه که آقای دکتر خورم این سهرانیش رو صحبت میکنند سوال جواب نداریم تا برنامهش تمام بشه بعد یه پنج دقیقه بریک خواهیم داشت و بعد بخش دومش مربوط به سوال و جواب خواهد بود که یه مقدار بتونیم از نظر وقت بتونیم به اصلا به موقع برنامه رو بتونیم به اتمام برسونیم آقای دکتر سیامک خورم فارتحصیل دانشکده میان رشته مهندسی کشاورزی از دانشکده کشاورزی دانشگاه تهران هستند و بعدا به آمریکا اومدند و در دو تا رشته در آمریکا تحصیل کردند در دوره فوق لیسانس مال علوم آب و مهندسی اونو در دانشگاه کالیفرنیا کمپس دیویس اونجا مسترش رو گرفتن و بعد اومدن به کمپس بعدی برکلی مال دانشگاه کالیفرنیا و اونجا در دکترای خودشون رو در رشته سندج از دور و آنالیز تصاویر ماهواره ای رو از دانشگاه برکلی مال دانشگاه کالیفرنیا برکلی کمپسش اونجا دکتراشون رو گرفتن و بعد از فارغ تحصیلی به هر حال همکاریشون رو با همون دانشگاه شروع کردن به ویژه دانشگاه برکلی و الان هم استاد اون دانشگاه هستن در زمینه سنجش از دور و آنالیز تصاویر ماهواره ای و در خب ایمیلی که براتون اومده به طور خلاصه بایو آقای دکتر خرم هست که من پیشنهاد میکنم بعد از اتمام به هر حال این سهرانی که داریم و این جلسه رو بعدا یه مرور مجددی روی این خلاصه بایوشو داشته باشید که من خیلی خیلی مختصر در مورد فعالیتایی که داشتن خدمتون خدمتون میگم و خب به عنوان استاد دانشگاه قاعدتا دانشجوی دوره دکترا و دانشجوی دوره فوق لیسانس به عنوان استاد مشاور در واقع وظیفه اصلی آقای دکتر خرم بوده که بیش از به عنوان استاد مشاور سی تا دانشجوی دوره دکترا داشته و خیلی خیلی بیشتر در دانشجویان دوره فوق لیسانس در همون دانشگاه برکلی و تا به حال هم سه تا کتاب تکس بوک در, در واقع علمی دانشگاهی رو منتشر شده از ایشون و الان به اصلا مورد استفاده قرار میگیره در دانشگاه ها و بیش از دویست هم مقاله علمی رو در سطح به اصلا مجلات علمی دانشگاه چیز بینلالی به چاپ رسیده مقالاتشون و یه نکته ای که هر حال من خواستم خدمتون بگم غیر از اون جنبه تدریسی و تحقیقاتی که در دانشگاه برکلی دارن ایشون عضو هیئت به اومنای دانشگاه بینرالی فضا هستن در فرانسه که اینو من خواهشی دارم از آقای دکتر خورم که یه مقدار در مورد این دانشگاه بیشتر برام صحبت بکنم و چه وظایفی رو و چه کارهای اجرایی و مطالعاتی رو به ویژه برای دروس به اصطلاح که اونجا یه سری مراکز تحقیقاتی رو اونجا را انداختند و مسئولیت بالایی هم داشتن در اون در اون دانشگاه بینرالی اگه یه مقداری بیشتر برامون به اصطلاح روشنتر بکنه خیلی ممنون میشم من خودم واقعیتش اینه که خیلی خیلی ناآشنا با این دانشگاه بینرالی فضا که میتونه این مقداری کمک بکنه از این نظر برها همکاری های دان... آقای دکتر خورم با سایر دانشگاه های کشور های دیگه خیلی زیادن ولی به صورت عمده فرانسه، آلمان و خود کانادا و کشور های خیلی چیز داره همکاری های خیلی نزدیکی داره در واقع 
امروز هم صحبت ایشون بیشتر در اون زمینه تحقیقاتی خودشون هست و اون کار تخصصی خودشون که مربوط به کاربرد سندش از دور هست که بی نهایت هم از نظر منابع طبیعی و هم از نظر کشاورزی و یا جنبه های دیگر رشته های مهندسی خیلی خیلی اهمیت داره برامون و میخوازم من دیگه به اصلا زیاد وقت برنامه رو الان نمیگیرم ولی اگر احتمالا نکته ای هم هست که من نتونستم اشاره بهش بکنم آقای دکتر خورم ممنون میشم که به اسرائیل مقداری توضیح بیشتری بدن بی نهایت ممنونم از این همکاری نزدیکی با ما داشتید و امروز سهران ما هستید خیلی خیلی خوش اومدید ممنونم از دوستان ممنون بفهمید آقای دکتر خورم ام. اول ببخشید من اگر اجازه بدین به زبان انگلیسی اینو سخنرانیمو انجام بدم به خاطر اینکه خیلی از واجه ها و چیزها رو نمیدونم فارسی شو و این رشته بوده که من در ایران نداشتم و در اینجا شروع کردم و, و بعدشم خیلی خیلی ممنون برای اومدنتون و خیلی خیلی ممنون برای از مهندس حمیدی for your invitation و I'm going to go ahead and start with the first slide مهندس فروزی لطفا شما اگر سکرین شیر بکنین and I will let you know that when I say next please advance to the next slide because I don't have the control of it مهندس فروزی he is muted آقای مهندس فروزی، سینا جان شما میوت هستید الان اومدن آقای سکرین رو شیر در تصویرتون دارید نه؟ نه هنوز نه من, من نمیبینم یه لحظه زده هنوز شیر نشده آن داری کم And then, is this the largest we can get, Mohandas Fulzi? Sinajan, full size, okay, good. Okay. Um, in the uh, slide, uh, okay. Now, uh, the other way around, go, go back to the first slide, please. Okay, there we go. Um, but, uh, this is a little bit about me. Uh, thanks again for coming. and, uh, and uh, the opportunity which is provided to me to make this presentation to you. Also, uh, Mr. Hamidi, thank you for the invitation. Next, please. Mohandas for, uh -huh. Man, Matalibi Kinjom Yam, there is a lot of material that I would reference and then they will have uh, the citations as well as the property of others. So if you ever use any of these materials, please make sure to give adequate credit so it won't get me in trouble with UC Berkeley. Next. And a little bit about me, since uh, Muad Samidi asked for it, uh, it's just uh, I finished my graduate degrees at the University of California and then joined them. And, and after that, uh, at the invitation of the North Carolina State University, I moved out there to establish a number of centers for them. And I established, first I established the uh, computer graphics center. I joined them as partly as a associate professor in electrical and computer engineering. And then, um, uh, and also associate professor at uh, forestry and environmental resources. And then my background has been pretty diverse along those lines. Then I established the Center for Earth Observation with the mission on remote sensing and uh, uh, geospatial information science and technology. I then it led into the uh, center, which is today's name for it, the geospatial analytics. And in those centers, we offered a number of degree programs and master of science in Geospatial Information Science and Technology, Master of Science in Natural Resources with the Geospatial Track, uh, minor university-wide minor in remote sensing and image analysis from several, for several, several programs, 
and the uh, number of GIS certificates. We have issued more than a thousand GIS certificates so far. And a PhD degree in geospatial analytics. We draw from eight different departments, all the way from the engineering to forestry, to uh, economics, to statistics, to mathematics, and so forth. In 1988, I participated in the formation of the International Space University on the MIT campus in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, or Cambridge, Massachusetts. And then from then I stayed with them. Every year I lectured in their programs. And then, and I moved to Strasbourg, France as the vice president of the University for Academic Affairs. And then there I established the Master of Space Studies program for them. Uh, which is a, a one-year program in uh, a multidisciplinary program, accepting students from various disciplines, all the way from, from medicine and law to engineering, to ecology, to natural resources, to economics and so forth. And then we established a Master of Space Management and then an, an executive MBA program with the focus in space. Uh, mainly for the technical staff of the aerospace industry that, um, that they wanted to send their people to get a heavy dose of space. Uh, oh, uh, okay, now, now, one more, one more. All right, thanks. And various professional degree programs. All right, next, please. And. The presentation outline, the introductory background that I just went through it, a very brief history of remote sensing, where we started, a touch on the basics and fundamentals, um, and uh, a bit on image acquisition, and then uh, and, uh, associated image processing techniques, and then also integrating that data with other databases, and give you a few examples of applications, both looking down towards Earth internal earth resources, as well as looking up toward the heavens for space studies. And then I will have a slide on the future trends and where we're going. Basically where we've been, where we are now, and where we're going in the future. Next, please. And the definition of remote sensing, the classic definition is studying an object or a phenomenon without being in physical contact with them. And then I have, expanded that definition to apply that saying that the science, art, and technology of detecting, recording, processing, integrating, analyzing, and applying information obtained by various devices, such as camera sensors and scanners, using both active and passive systems, data acquisition systems, from various platforms, all the way from drones to balloons to aircraft to satellites and so forth on the objects or phenomena without being in physical contact with them. The way, next please. A bit about the history. When remote sensing, the way it started as my major professor at Berkeley, Dr. Robert Caldwell, late Robert Caldwell uh, mentioned, he's the one who put this definition for it that saying that Remote sensing started when the caveman came out of the cave, stood on the platform, glanced over the landscape. It had two things in mind. One, a food source. Where can I find food and water? And two, I have to be careful not to become a food source for whomever is there. So these two questions, that was, the, the true form of remote sensing as it started way back then. And then into the modern era, and here we've got um, the first photograph started in 1827 in Paris. Then in 1839, the photograph was taken from the roof of this building and then uh, in Paris again, and as you look down, you can see a man getting a shoe shine there. Uh, is my arrow showing on the screen as I move around? I don't think so. Okay, and then started in uh, taking pictures from the balloons in 1858, 
And in 1879, Kodak developed the first film that no longer dealing with the cracked and shrunken photos. The film uh, preserved the, the images pretty well. And then they put cameras on the burst of pigeons, actually took some pretty good pictures. And then in 1903, Wright brothers, which they were from Ohio, and they moved to North Carolina, and they set up camp in Kitty Hawk, which is on the outer banks of North Carolina, with the right side of it being Atlantic Ocean and the left side of it being the sound water, and lots of really uh, interesting pattern winds that comes there. And that lent itself for development of flight, and eventually they did fly there. And then they took the first aerial photograph, conventional aerial photograph from there. Next, please. And then in 1921, in World War I, the first photograph was taken over the uh, uh, a bridge that doesn't show in this image, but it will once Dr. Mr. Furuzi uh, uh, punched the button. And there, there we go. And then here you see that uh, this is the very first reconnaissance photograph was taken by military people in 1921 in World War I. And then the first image uh, of space is the one to the right that comes from there, that the first photograph taken from the space. And then at the, in 1960, in 1960 again, Titus N was sent up that took the picture which shows up in the lower left. Next, please. In 1966, the Lunar um, Orbiter Program uh, spacecraft took this picture of showing Earth suspended in space as a, as a ball, as a globe, which electrified the, the world. Next, please. And in 1972, Apollo 17 took this very famous picture yeah. of the blue marble, which uh, uh, from the uh, from the space at uh, twenty eight thousand miles up, and that inspired a lot of others from taking pictures of uh, of the Earth as a globe. Next, please. I also want to apologize that I'm moving very quickly because of the time limitation. We only have one hour, so. Uh, Sorry about that. And I don't mean to show you a whole bunch of pretty pictures without the proper explanation, but please bear with me, we'll live through it. And then a brief history of Earth observation and U-2 aircraft in 1956 went up. As you know, if you fly 50, over 50,000 feet from the, uh, from the Earth, you cannot be seen. So the U-2 was a spy for a plane. One man operation, the, the one that I met was uh, Martin Knudsen, which was the pilot and the remote sensor and uh, started that program. It's a very large aircraft uh, with a big wind span and underneath the wings is full of fuel and flies quite a, a few distances. And then, and then in 1957, the first Russian satellite and the American satellites went up in 1973, Skylab went up. They took a whole bunch of very interesting pictures. And then it uh, entered the, the atmosphere and broke up. And pieces of it came from in different parts of the Earth. In 1972, in July 23 of 72, the first Landsat went up, which at that time they called it ERTS, Earth, Earth Resources Technology Satellite, Mission A, that later on they changed the name to Landsat 1. Today, Landsat 8 is flying and fairly continuously from that time on providing data from the Earth's surfaces. And then in 1981, Space Shuttle went up, that which is now retired. And 1986, French Space Agency sent up the SPOT satellite. In, from 2001, the, the game changed, a whole bunch of higher resolution satellite data came available, all the way from motors, beers, Iconis. These are probably a whole bunch of names for you, but some of you may be quite familiar with it. And then, and then the aircraft, the, the primarily NASA has the two 
major aircrafts that provided lots of uh, high spectral resolution data, such as hyperspectral data. And then, then internationally, a lot of satellite went up. Canada was the first one to send up the radar sat, and then which provided radar data from space for the, a lot of the projects and so forth. Then the Canadian Space Agency was one of our uh, major cooperators in uh, including NASA and others at the International Space University in France. And then, then we went to spot French people, ERS, the European Space Agency people, the LOS and MOS from Japanese and IRS from Indian, CBRS from the cooperation between um, China and Brazil, Sentinel, Comsat from um, Sentinel from um, from was built by by Austrian Austrian Space Agency, and then Comsat and Piliadis and, and and more and more. There are a lot of them, and then the weather satellite. There are only three weather satellites that covers the entire weather forecasting for the globe. GOES, which is the U.S. satellites, Meteosat, which is the European and Meteor, which is the Russian. Next, please. In this slide, I have four publications. I've written all four of them, and there's a lot of information about the history, about the spacecraft, about the resolution and data characteristics and so forth. I invite you to look at them for more details if you like. Next, please. There are a lot of satellites out there, a lot. And there are weather satellites, communication satellites, Earth observation satellites, as we talked about, the, the GPS constellation satellites, and a whole bunch of military satellites. Next, please. All of them, the remote sensing, whole remote sensing science is based on the, the energy which is reflected or emitted uh, via as a mechanism of the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic spectrum is defined as all energy that moves in the velocity of light in a harmonic wave pattern. What is harmonic wave pattern? Is all waves that they are equally and repetitively spaced in time. All waves are the same and they are get repeated in a certain wavelength at the same speed. Next, please. The electromagnetic radiation starts from, if you go to the top left, gamma rays, and then all the way comes to the AM radios. And there is no limit on the left side, on right side. I personally believe that not all of the laws of physics have been discovered yet. So there are lots of things out there that we don't know yet. And then out of that electromagnetic spectrum, only a very small, narrow part of that is visible which our eyes are sensitive to, and we can see it. And then that is the visible light. It starts from um, indigo, violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, as you go from lower wavelength to the higher wavelength, starting from 320 nanometers, going to 760 nanometers. Next, please. And the reflective and emitted properties are the ones that we, we utilize to identify the features and the phenomena. And then here I have an example of five features. One is vegetation in green. As you look at the 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, you go from blue to green to red. And as you see, there is a little bump in the green part of that and that uh, vegetation reflects about 15% as opposed to under 10% for the uh, blue and gray, uh, red. So that way, that's why and our eyes are sensitive to that. We see the vegetation as green, but vegetation reflects a lot more infrared as you go to the right of that. And, and since our eyes are not sensitive to it, we don't see it that way. And then, so, and then, the water is the clear 
uh, clearly water, uh, clear water absorbs a lot of infrared. Water loves infrared. And then, but as the materials in the water, suspended matter, inorganic matter, organic matter, and so forth, yes, then that reflective properties change. And then it is that soil is a, is a fairly uh, flat reflector, reflects in blue and green and red and, and infrared, depending on what's in the soil. Next, please. Primarily, the satellite there, we have two types of orbits that satellites went. One on the left is a polar orbiting, which looks, it's a sun synchronous, meaning that it looks at an Earth at the same solar time, typically about 10.48 AM, looks, look, covers, the, covers the Earth. And as the Earth rotates, the satellite orbits around it. That is roughly about 570 miles, about 700 to 800 kilometers up there, the altitude of the satellite. On the right side, there are the other type of orbit, which is in a much higher altitude, about 2,200 miles up. And it is synchronized with the rotation of Earth. As the Earth rotates, the satellite rotates around it. So that way, it, uh, uh, synch uh, synchronizing with, with the Earth uh, to cover the, the day that the Earth uh, rotates. And a good example of the geosynchronous satellites is weather satellites. A good example of the polar orbiter satellite is Landsat and Earth observing satellites. Next, please. There are two types of sensors, active sensors and passive sensors. The passive center is that if it's illuminated with the, the surface of the earth, which is irradiated by the sun, and then the energy gets either reflected or emitted, and we've got a detector out there, a scanner that detects it and records it. That is passive. Active is we artificially send a signal down hits the object, bounces back, we record the return beam. And example of that is radar is a good example. Synthetic aperture radar is another example. And LIDAR, which is a laser beam sending down and being recorded up. Next, please. We characterize the satellite and aircraft data, remote sensing data, we characterize them with four resolutions. One is spatial resolution. Simply put, spatial resolution is the smallest object that you can resolve on satellite or aircraft imagery. Spectral resolution, the data come in number of bands. Each band has a certain interval in terms of the wavelength. And then, so a number of wave bands and the range of the wavelength in each band defines the spectral characteristics of the remote sensing data. Then is the radiometric data. All of this data are numbers that they come down. And if there are eight bit, two to the power of X bit data, two to the power of eight means eight bit data, which is 1024, uh, levels, which means that if you take from white to black, you divide that spectrum to 1024 levels. The higher the bit number, the higher the radiometric resolution. I'll give you an example of all of these. Temporal mean is simply meaning that how often the satellite visits the same piece of ground on Earth. It's like Landsat comes over every 26 days, Spot comes over every 16 days, and so forth. Next, please. This is a good example of the, of the spatial resolution. There are four images here. Top left is a 30 meter resolution, meaning that each one of those boxes that you see is 30 meter by 30 meter all objects that they fall within that 30 meter, that 30 by 30 meter 
and have reflection or emission. And that reflected properties gets averaged and one number is recorded for that pixel on a given band of satellite data. So, and then if you go to the right, the top right is 20 meter resolution, which means that you can see a lot more data as the spatial resolution gets higher. The lower left is 10 meter resolution. Now we can see the shape of the objects a lot better. And lower right is one meter resolution. Which, uh, this is a famous image from University of Wisconsin in Madison that has been provided for this purpose. So we can, as you go to one meter resolution, you can see a lot more detail. That's an example of the spatial resolution. Next, please. Spectral resolution, as I said, it becomes, the data comes in different bands. In this case, this is one example of Iconus uh, specifications, which means that the data comes in blue, green, red, and infrared band. So, these are, uh, each one of them, uh, say like blue has 445 to 516 nanometer range and respectively the rest of them have their own. And also data comes in panchromatic, which is a black and white broad spectrum, blue, green, red, and a bit of infrared, which has uh, 450 to 900 nanometer. Remember from 760 nanometer out, we get into the infrared, in this case, near infrared. So that's an example of the spectral resolution. Some satellite data have 11 bands, some have four bands, most have four bands. Some aircraft data has 224 bands, the average data. So the spectral resolution varies and it's all over the map. Next, please. Radiometric resolution example of that. The, red, the data comes in bit, two to the power of X. In this case, two to the power of eight on the left side, left image, two to the power of 11 on the right image. And as you can see on the left image, the uh, cloud shadow obscures the features underneath. You cannot see them, discern what they are. And if you go to 11 bit data of the same thing, you can identify the features. The higher the radiometric resolution, the sharper the images you're going to get in terms of radiometric resolution. Next, please. What do we do with all of data? There are various ways of analyzing, processing, and displaying the data. The most common image display systems are panchromatic, as I said, black and white, broad spectrum, the color composites. The data comes in various bands. Blue band, green band, red band, infrared band, number of infrared bands. If you, and when you display the data, you can assign a color of your choice to each band. If you assign blue color to blue band and green color to green band and red color to red band, you get what we call it a true color composite, which means that features show up in the same color that if you fly over them and look at them. False color composite, you can assign whatever color that you want to any of these bands. And then the standard false color composite, which is utilized quite a bit in remote sensing, is that if you assign, if you assign, uh, you eliminate the blue. If you assign blue color to green band, green color to red band and red color to infrared band, then you can capture a lot of the features that they have a lot of infrared reflection that your eyes cannot see it. They're invisible to your eyes, but, but you can assign and you map them. An example of that, I'll show you in a bit later. Classified and integrated images, you can, there are a whole variety of image classification techniques supervised and supervised uh, neural network, simulated and yielding a whole bunch of them that you can, you can apply to the satellite data. And you can integrate satellite data with all kinds of other conventional and surveyed form data. And also you can apply any mathematical functions to any of these numbers coming from the bands. 
you can multiply bands together, you can add them together, you can subtract them together, you can divide them together. A good example of it is, which is very well known and well used, well accepted, is the normalized difference vegetation index, which pulls out the vegetation. And if you take infrared minus red and divide it to infrared plus red, you get NDVI. And I'll show you an example of that. Next, please. Mandus Furuzi, next, please. Okay. This is an example of if showing like a true color image to the left and a false color, standard false color image to the right. So that's an infrared picture of a leaf and that's a visible picture of the leaf. Same leaf. Next, please. I'll show you an example. This is a panchromatic example of the San Francisco Bay Area. And I wish I had the control to be able to move around and show you around. This is my backyard. So, and this is panchromatic. Next. This is a true color composite. All the forested areas are green. All the vegetation is green. All the urban areas around the perimeter of the Bay Area and the city of San Francisco is in a gray level and so forth. That's the true color composite, similar to that green leaf that I showed you. Next, please. That's the standard false color composite. Remember that we map the infrared ray reflectance to red bands. So all of the vegetation, which have much larger infrared reflection than the, in the visible. The visible reflection tops at 15% infrared can go all the way up to 65%. So, and shows up here, and it is a lot more sh sharper in the infrared than it is not only here, but also if you look in the space, then, you know, the, the James Webb telescope uses the infrared to look at the stars. And next, please. Other kind of display, this is a thermal image. This is the color of the ocean. And as you see around the perimeter of the yellow uh, on the screen, it, it is the East Coast boundary of, of the United States. There is uh, uh, Washington DC is up there, Virginia is here, North Carolina is here and so forth. And as you go here, as you go from blue to green, to yellow, to orange, to red, you go from low temperature values to high temperature values. And here, as you go into the ocean from the land, you get to a region that is very high temperature values. That is the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream there is a little bit coming closer to the shore and going further, pulling further out. And that's why from May to October, there are some beautiful 85 degree water in the coast of uh, North Carolina, for example, on the beaches. Some of the best beaches in the US are there. And also the, the, in the Gulf of Stream, there, for those of you who are interested, perfect deep sea fishing there. Yeah. If you go over there, there is abundance of all kinds of fish and, and sea creatures. Next, please. The other example is the uh, is the weather forecasting and hurricane forecasting. This is Hurricane Floyd that was uh, captured by CWIF, the Sea Viewing Wide Field uh, Spectrometer, uh, Imaging Spectrometer. And look at the look at the areas that this this thing covers. Look at the bottom of that. That is Florida. Look at the top right. That is Nova Scotia and Canada. Look at the middle of the image, upper limit, that's the Great Lakes. From the, this top bottom of the Florida to, to Canada, it's more than 2,000 miles. This hurricane covered more than 2,000 miles in the, under, under its uh, span. And at the time that came over, I was living right, I, I wish I could, my cursor would work so I can show you exactly where I was. About somewhere in the middle of that. But, I'm here today to talk to you. Next, please. This is a very high resolution worldview four image of the Louvre Museum in, in, in Paris. And as you can see here, you can see the individuals and their shadows and roughly about the uh, 1.4 meter resolution data multispectral 
and then and 41 centimeter or so uh, in in um, single band uh, panchromatic. Next, please. Another example of that GOI one which is 41 centimeter in panchromatic and 1.65 in, um, in the multispectral. GUI-1 is the satellite that Google Earth is using. So all of the Google Earth data comes from this satellite. And GUI-2 is currently under construction. And so it should be hopefully up next year. Next, please. This is an iconic image of Acapulco. And take a look at the area to the lower uh, left, which uh, in the red box, that's the marina. And next, that is how it shows up. And that's very, very sharp images. This type of data is available worldwide on repeated basis. Next, please. Or, or the, uh, the airborne system of, of the San Francisco, the, the, the Marina Bay in the middle and the bridge on the left is the Golden Gate Bridge. Next, that's the focusing on the Golden Gate Bridge. You can see individual cars, individual boats and what have you. Next, please. And focusing further with a bit image enhancement, you can identify the type of cars. Next, please. This is uh, from the space shuttle. This is the uh, shuttle imaging radar band C that came out. This is over the San Francisco Bay. And then the, the smooth surfaces show up dark. The rough surfaces such as buildings and uh, features uh, have reflections in lighter. And then here, as you can see, I wish I could move, move around and show you more of that. Next, please. And another one is that in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, you know the, the coral reefs and, and the sea life and the quality of coastal waters and it's impacted by um, oil spills in, in many, many occasions. And here is in the Gulf of Mexico and then the oil spill that I believe came from one of these oil platforms on the, in the ocean. Next, please. And another uh, active system is, is LIDAR, which is uh, you send a beam of laser down from the aircraft and then hits the ground, you uh, detect the return pulse and record it and then further analyze it. And it is both radar and laser are uh, active systems that they are weather independent you can it's a day and night capability as well as all weather capability it, the signal goes right through the clouds and rain and everything next please that's an image of radar on, in Bixer area in Bixby bridge and then uh, if you have traveled on highway one from San Francisco to Los Angeles you'll pass this bridge and then uh, it's a uh, on the right, it's a regular photograph of the bridge. On the left is the laser um, image of the bridge. Both on the top left is looking down from that. And then and also on the lower left is side looking. And uh, the LIDAR data is used in, in forestry quite a bit for tree height, canopy, and canopy structure, and also used in biomass modeling and biomass estimation. Next, please. As I said, the data and satellite data comes in, in various bands and they're all in numbers. And for a given pixel on the, on the left side, which is uh, and if I live black, each one will say like in, in band five, four, three, two, one, each one of them has a, has a digital number, which uh, uh, is reflective properties in that band of all of the features which are that is that in that pixel. And then we take that information and we use the image processing techniques. Next, please. We use a, 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 a 
image classification technique. We take that band and run it through that, and we come up with the image on the right side, which in this case now we know that you know all the deciduous forests and light green are the coniferous forests and dark green agriculture is in in yellow and water is in blue. And then so and then this is a very simplified example of uh, image classification, converting the digital numbers of each band from satellite data to a land use and land cover feature that of interest of, to the users. Next, please. This is another example. In this particular case, we were after um, uh, impervious surface areas, and you can see a true color composite of it in the top and classified image in the bottom, and clearly identifying the impervious surface area as well as deciduous forest, coniferous forest, water, and, and barren soil and disturbed soil. Next, please. Data fusion is very big in remote sensing. <coughs> there are a number of data fusion techniques that apply the, uh, the most um, widely applied one is the principal component analysis. And all of those were, they, they distort the, the integrity of the spectral integrity of the data. And we use a lot of that spectral integrity and spectral characteristics of the data in our modeling efforts of whatever that we were doing. This is a quick bird image of pyramids in Egypt. And then if you look at that little red box in my next slide, I'm going to blow it up and tell you that uh, uh, what happens if you develop the uh, fusion data. Fusion basically means that you take the lower spatial resolution data and fuse it with higher spatial resolution. You take the lower spectral resolution data and fuse it with the higher spectral resolution data and you sharpen the images quite a bit. And in the process of sharpening, you are convoluting the data. This was a problem for us. So we developed a technique that preserved the spectral integrity of the data. And it is, we're patenting it and it's patent pending right now. And we're using it quite a bit in our laboratories and on all of our graduates. So next, please. On the left is the original data blown up to the pixel level before fusion. On the right is the same data after we applied the techniques that we developed for that. And there is a lot of applications for data fusion. For example, you hurt your knee. You go to an orthopedist and says that, go get an x-ray of your knee. Okay, you get an x-ray of knee. What does he do? Either he displays it on the screen or hooks it up to a light table and being familiar with the, with the anatomy of human being, you can detect a lot of abnormalities. Then he doesn't find anything. And he said, oh, it must be the soft tissue, the ligaments and so forth. And then oh, go get an MRI. You go get an MRI and then this, way, this time you, you can look at that. And then so a human eye can only detect 32 gray levels from black to white. But in data fusion techniques, you can display those you can fuse those two data together, display them and assign 1024 colors to each one of those pixels. So it leads into a pre-visual detection. And then what is the value of pre-visual detection? If somebody goes and gets a mammogram and if you can go to pre-visually detect it, that you can detect a cancerous cell three years ahead of time, what's the value of that? So data fusion has a long, long ways to go. Next, please. The other one, data integration. You can integrate the raster data that comes with the satellite and aircraft data, and then with the vector data, digitized data of very conventional and survey type data, and through various modeling for a lot of different variety of things. Next, please. One of the applications that California is a hotbed for wildland fires. And we have a large number of wildland fires here. 
And so one of the projects that, that we did for NASA, this is a NASA funded project, which is uh, served as the principal investigator still going on. And then, so we, we had the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory flying the, uh, the aircraft, the Gulf Stream 3 for us with the synthetic aperture radar, as well as the hyperspectral labrus data. And as well as we use the, the Landsat thematic mapper data, which is on the left side. And then as well as some of the data that came from uh, uh, Sierra Pacific Industries, which was one of our cooperators on the project from their helicopters and then the field crew. And then we mapped the severity of the wildland fire, as well as we modeled the emission of the smoke emission of the burnt areas. And in terms of particulate matters, in this case, two and a half micron particulate matters. And then on the left side, on the top left, that's the Landsat TM data. All those stripes, black stripe means bad data lines, means zero. And then we had to massage the data, do a lot, apply different techniques to it, and came with the bottom left, which we made that data out of the top ones, and then integrated with the synthetic aperture radar and many other data types. And then we came up with the image on the right, which is dark red, is the high, uh, highly burn, which means that the severity of the burn was high to moderate to low. And, and there is a lot, of, a, a lot of applications for that. And California Air Resources Board was one of another cooperator of us that they're using that for in their air quality studies for prescribing uh, the, what areas can be uh, prescribed burning. Next, please. An example of the, of the normalized difference vegetation index, NDVI, that I talked about for mapping the, the vegetation, the global coverage of vegetation. Next, please. This is another one of that global mapping of vegetation based on Landsat TM data. And uh, this was done by, by uh, Peng Gong, one of my colleagues at Berkeley, same department. And then, so he's no longer with Berkeley anymore. And then here is, you can have the, the vegetation cover of the globe every 30 meter by 30 meter pixel. And there's a lot of power to that because a lot of the parts of the world has not been mapped as far as the detailed mapping of the vegetation and so forth. Next, please. Another example of modeling for water quality. This was one of my project, which was again funded by NASA. And then uh, we mapped for uh, water quality in terms of the chlorophyll concentration, uh, suspended matters, turbidity and salinity. And as you can see on the left side is the Pacific Ocean. And as the water comes through the Golden Gate Bridge, flushes down to the San Francisco Bay and going up and the fresh water coming from the uh, San Joaquin and Sacramento River flushing down toward the system, the two forces collide. A lot of upwelling occurs and a lot of high nutrient comes in the water and becomes a very high biological activities and very high ecologically sensitive area. And then there, there's a nuclear power plant right down below. And then, so that's one of them. And then next, please. This is another example of mapping the phytoplankton in the larger scale is that uh, is uh, uh, just, just south of Washington DC on the Potomac River as it enters the Ches Chesapeake Bay, different hues of green in the water means different concentrations of phytoplankton, which also leads into the more phytoplankton leads into the zooplankton and fish and shrimp and other things. Next, please. Moving into a larger scale, this is done by NASA in the, off the coast of Patagonia in Argentina. And you can see the, the uh, phytoplankton flux in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with different concentrations and so forth. And each one of them ecologically has a lot of meaning. And 
a lot of importance. Next, please. This is another one that the that, that, uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center did a lot of uh, studies on the, on, the, on the Antarctic about the ozone hole. And uh, in the ozone hole as in, in the springtime, there, there, is a, there is a circulating cold air around the earth and around the polar uh, areas. And then and that creates a lot of uh, protecting a lot of the ozone and so forth. And then as, as the weather, as the temperature rises, and then that, that vortex starts breaking down and by, by in October and by December, it becomes back to normal. And then this ozone hole uh, was discovered in 80s. And then and there's a lot of data that comes toward modeling that one uh, uh, done by NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And then one of the studies that, that one of the investigators in, in Goddard said that, the Copernicus said that the eventually this ozone hole shows the sign of recovery. But by the time that uh, it's expected and in 2060s or 2070s, it will be recovered back to normal. And that's a, that's a long time to wait, isn't it? And then next, please. Another global application, this is the Helheim Glacier in Greenland. And then as you can see that in, from, uh, in 2001, the margin, the edge of the glacier was here. And in 2003 is retracted back toward land further up. And in 2005 is, is further back. And then between 2001 and 2005, the margin retracted landwards at seven and a half kilometers or about 4.7 miles. And it is, uh, speed of retraction increased from eight to 11 gram kilometers per year. So glaciers are retracting and ice sheets are, are thinning and breaking down and melting and causing the sea level rise. Next, please. And then talking about the sea level rise, this is uh, data coming for intergovernmental panel on climate control that they issued in 2007, that from 1993 until then, um, the, the sea level has risen approximately 3.1 millimeter per year. And then and as you can see here, there are areas, the sea level rise around north of Australia and so forth, more than some other areas. And so that is a, a major concern as, uh, as you know, as the global warming occurs and the CO2 level goes up and the counter radiation goes up and then the sea level uh, glaciers start melting and retracting and uh, sea level rises. Next, please. Another global application of that is the mapping the, the CO2 level, CO2 concentration and CO2 basically slows down the exchange of the, the escaping of the heat from the, the, uh, the earth to the atmosphere, which causes in some ways global warming. And then one of the contributors. And then this has been studied quite a bit by NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Next, please. Looking down, now let's look up a little bit. And you know, remote sensing is not just applied to Earth resources. Remote sensing is applied to studying the objects without physically contacting them. And then this is mapping the moon, surface of the moon, the topography of the moon, basically by, by the, the, the resolution of 328 feet being the, being the resolution of the, of the topography data. And uh, primarily, this has been doing using the laser altimeter, which is uh, uh, attached to the scanner uh, on the aircraft, spacecraft. Next, please. 
again, looking at mercury, all of those colors represent different mineral, different geologic features, this is different physical features. So the NASA is studying a lot of the planets outside of Earth too. Next, please. Or the or the gas giant Jupiter. This is Galileo image of one of the moons of Jupiter and, and happened to be able to capture it when there was a, an eruption and you can see the left side of the image, the orange color being the lava, fresh lava. And then you can also, as you come toward the right, you can see the perimeter of the lava flow as part of the eruption. And you can see two darker spots, one up there, one middle lower, uh, this is cooled lava and so forth. So there is a lot of studies being going on of not only just Earth, but also other things. Next, please. Some of the pictures, this, this really uh, 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 excited me that you can take an image, make an image of the area from 6 million kilometers away. That's a long distance to take a picture and to be able to capture Pluto and its moon. Next, please. The latest, the, the Curiosity rover right now is on Mars, collecting samples from the rocks and the soil on Mars and analyzing it. How cool is that? I mean, this is really studying things all the way down, all the way up there. And there's a lot of information on that in the LASA, in the Mars Science Laboratory, those of you who would be interested to look into it. Next, please. The, toward the end of the presentation, on the left is the James Webb Space Telescope, on the right is the Hubble Space Telescope, Hubble, until James Webb came up and Hubble has the, we had the, the, the highest resolution images of, of space, outer space coming from the Hubble. But then NASA spent um, 25 years and $10 billion to put together the James Webb tel telescope and put it up to that uh, next uh, slide, please, to go up to 1 million miles and start taking pictures of the other space that we have never seen. On the top left <coughs> of the nebula and so forth that, that Hubble Space Telescope has taken next to it is same area has been imaged by, by James Webb Space Telescope. See how much more details and stores you can see that we've never seen. Nobody has ever seen that. And, and the same thing with the lower images to the left is the Hubble and to the right is the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. And uh, next please. This is the first image of looking out the James Webb Telescope sent out. And these are the stars and, and galaxies and nebula and other things that we've never seen before. I mean, the, the humanity is looking at it for the first time. Next, please. A bit about the fusion. Where are we going with the remote sensing technology? These are some of the things that, in my opinion, is going to be happening. One is minimization and integration of optics and electronics. Things will get smaller and smaller. The limitation is going to be the size of our fingers. And, and Touch screen is eliminating some of that, but not to the same thing, but things are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Then further development of new platforms, you know, different countries will be developing new satellites, new aircrafts, new spacecraft, and development of small satellites. CubeSat, which is now being, uh, being launched from the International Space Station, is already up there and operating and microsat and nanosat satellites at the size of a milk carton with all the bells and whistles and, and imaging uh, devices and so forth in it and communication things in it. Development of 
advances in computing, cloud computing, and biological computing. And the computing power will increase dramatically. Ray Coswell, which was one of the uh, front runners of, uh, of um, the computing technology, a graduate of MIT, and he's the one with Peter Diamond who started at the Singularity University out of NASA Ames. And then Ray Coswell says that in the year 2047, the computing power of computers will surpass the brain computing power of human. So he, he made that statement about five, six years ago. He was 62 years old. And now, now he's really changing his lifestyle to be able to live until then to be able to experience that. He's, I, I, I've been told that he doesn't eat solids. He takes 26 pills and, and uh, liquids and so forth. And I don't know, don't quote me on that. And then, uh, so the increase in progress in aperture and larger antenna for most, mostly active systems, increase in transmitter power of the active devices, which will go a long ways. And then sensors, cameras, radar, and artificial intelligence getting in there. A good example of that is autonomous vehicles that being developed. That's remote sensing too. And then, you know, and, and, and eventually at some point, uh, nobody will be driving. And so we'll see when that will come about. Advances in the storage technology, in the, in the cloud storage, in places like the, uh, the uh, Salesforce and places like the Microsoft and others that um, are into, into the cloud technology. Advances in mobile computing. Uh, the, 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 the telephones that we have now is just not just a telephone. We can do a whole bunch of different things in, with it. And then advances in, uh, uh, in outer space exploration, yes, uh, and private sectors like SpaceX, Blue Origin, and many more to come. International Space Station, Curiosity Rover, James Webb's Space Telescope, increases in tunable systems and flexible, no longer you're set to a, to a given interval. And advanced techniques in processing the data, the big data or data science is a big thing. The climate change and the big data is the, the latest one. Next, please. And if you're standing on Mars and looking at Earth, this is what you'll see. That little tiny dot on the screen is Earth. So everything that we are experiencing, everybody that has lived in the past, living now, or will live in the future, every rich person, every poor person, every pope, every ayatollah, every, uh, every engineer, every scientist, everybody is in that tiny little blue dot suspended in space amongst billions of other dots suspended in space. See how fragile we are. Civilizations on earth has come and gone. Now we are truly a global community with our transportation systems and communication systems and so forth. And then we can, if we don't do it right, we can all fall together. We have only one home as of now to protect. Next, please. And yet, what do we do for that one home that we have? We pollute our oceans, we pollute, uh, we destroy our forests, we destroy our land and so forth. And that's not enough. We put a lot of junk in the space. All the, all the broken pieces of satellites, inactive satellites and so forth. There is, space is full of junk, full. And then, yeah, to give you an example, SpaceX alone so far has spent 1,700 satellites out to provide through the uh, Starlink program to provide internet services to different parts of the, of in, the in this particular case, the US. And is adding a map more and more and more. And then so space 
is a global commons, belongs to all of us. It's a global resource. And we need, we badly need an organization that has the authority and its capability of protecting that. Because what we do on Earth is something on the surface of the Earth is something. What we do to our orbit is something else that, that impacts all of us. Next, please. With that, I thank you for your time, for coming, for your attention, for giving me the opportunity to tell you a bit about, about the remote sensing technology. And again, Juan Hamidi, thank you for invitation. I am happy to answer any question, to try to answer any questions you may have. دکتر خورم بی نهایت ممنونم از مطالبی که اشاره بیش کردید به بسیار بسیار جالب و مفید خیلی چیزا رو من اصلا نمیدونستم واقعا یاد گرفتم <تصفيق> اینه که بی نهایت ممنونم از دوستان دوستان عزیز طبق اون برنامه قبلی که صحبت شد این بخش رو الان تا چند دقیقه دیگه رکورد میشه و بعد شما اگر یه چیزی رو مس کردید و میخواید دوباره مروری بشه روی این پریزنتیشن آقای دکتر خورم اینو ما رکوردش رو در وبسایت کانون میذاریم و میتونید دوباره از نو همه رو مرور بکنید اگر چیزی مس شده از نظر به اصلا این پاورپوینتش در نتیه این در دسترس خواهد بود بعدا قطعا در خدمت دوستان خواهیم گفت در تلگرام و اینا اینه که بعدا میشه به اصلا وبسایت کانون رو چک بکنید و مرور بکنید این پریزنتیشن رو برحال بی نهایت ممنونم آید تو خیلی خیلی سوال. ممنونم از دوستتون که این سوال نمیشه که الان دوستان عزیز ما یه پنج دقیقه بریک میدیم که هم آقای دکتر خورم یک نفسی تازه بکنند و, و بعدا برمیگردیم برای سوال